Right. <clears throat> okay. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome James Pomeroy of Lloyd's Register today, who has kindly agreed to deliver this session. Um, I'm going to shortly hand you over to him, uh, and he will uh, run through the session. But before I do that, we've also got Alison Hind, who's joining us, uh, and she's going to give uh, a brief introduction. Alison's very much the driving force behind uh, arranging these webinars, uh, so she'll uh, have a few things to say beforehand. Uh, firstly, before I do hand you over to Alison. Uh, I just wanted to go through a few things with you. So firstly, for those of you who haven't attended one of our Irish webinars, I'm Ben Pollard and I take care of the technical aspects of these sessions. So um, any problems and I try to assist as best as I can. Uh, so on your screen then, uh, located at the top left hand side, you'll notice a small bar with some written options on them. Uh, these are chat and Q&A. If you have any technical issues or audio problems uh, and you need to message me at any point, then please use the chat option. If you have any messages for James at all with relation to the, the content of the presentation, please ask those questions in the Q&A box. Uh, at the end of James's presentation, we'll then go through, um, we'll go into an, in, an interactive uh, Q&A session where you will all be given the chance uh, to ask questions verbally. Um, but again, I'll come through, uh, I'll go through that uh, after the presentation. Uh, so, and I'll explain more about how that's going to work. So uh, finally, just so that you are all aware as well, uh, the session is being recorded for future playback. So with all that said, I'm going to hand you over to Alison uh, and she's just going to do a quick introduction and introduce the session for you. So Alison, over to you. Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this uh, IOSH Swiss Network webinar. Uh, particularly welcome to James Pomeroy, who is going to share his thoughts on um, transforming global health safety environmental programs this morning. I just wanted very quickly to have a talk through what we've been up to and what we have planned for the future. Um, so at the beginning of halfway through October, uh, we had our second face-to-face -face meeting, which was hosted by Nespresso. It was a fantastic day. Um, the format of having a couple of good presentations, a networky lunch and then a tour around the site um, and talk to the, the factory manager and the health safety environment people there afterwards about what we'd seen. Um, it, it, I, I thought it was uh, um, a format that worked very well and hopefully something that we can repeat in the future. So coming up, we have some webinars and dates for your diary. Rob Shaw is going to talk to us uh, at the end of November about slips, trips and falls. Um, Rob uh, has worked for 14 years with the UK regulator. Um, he has done investigations, research into this area. He's going to talk to us about um, how to prevent slips, trips and falls, what works, what doesn't, and why that is the case. Then moving into next year, uh, we have Andrew Sharman, um, who is Swiss-based. Um, he is a well-known author and public speaker. Um, you may have heard him speak before. Um, particularly relevant because he is the president-elect for IOSH, which means he takes over being president, I think, in um, September um, of next year. So we get in just before that happens um, to hear him talk about safety culture, leadership and behaviour. Then this will be followed at, uh, in March by Derek Mowbray. Derek is a chartered psychologist. Um, he uh, is an expert in workplace stress um, and uh, setting up um, environments to try and relieve that, um, to try and reduce the stresses and triggers. Um, so he's going to, to give us a talk about that. Um, which leads us into the next face-to-face -face meeting. It should be in April, that would be six months later, but looking at the calendar, we've got Easter and um, lots of school holidays and bank holidays in there. Um, so probably pushing it into May. Um, and David and myself are trying to set up something for that at the moment. Uh, we'll let you know a date as soon as possible. Um, and please do book it in. Even before, so, so we, we generally go to IOSH and they produce us a, a beautiful glossy brochure, uh, but it takes time. So we have the date before we have the brochure. So if you can book it in as soon as possible so that um, we don't get people that miss out for that, that would be great. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, 
if you if there's anything missing from there you have any new ideas anything you'd like us to to talk about to look into um or you'd like to offer your site as a a, a venue for a face-to-face -face meeting then please do get in touch love to hear from you Okay, um, I'm going to hand over to James Pomeroy now. So James is the Health, Safety, Environment and Security Director for Lloyd's Register. This is a, a global engineering and business services company. And uh, James has spent, I don't know, his career 20 years uh, looking at global transformation um, and has some wonderful experiences that he's going to share with us this morning. So thank you very much, James. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alison. And hopefully you can all see uh, the materials I'm sharing with you now. Um, and if not, then please uh, raise a question to, to Ben. Um, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to talk to you. Um, we at Lloyd's Register, we have a, a, a refresh program uh, on uh, refreshing our safety and environmental program. Uh, we've been doing this for about two years and I'll come on to some of the reasons behind it. So the theme of what I'd like to talk to you this morning about is about simplification um, and speaking to all sectors, all industries and, and many organisations, they're all talking about a similar challenge, which is the complexity of how we've made safety um, and how with increasing complexity, it's, it's disconnecting and not making a connection with the employees. So what I would like to do is to share with you what we're doing. We're not perfect. Um, we are aiming to, to improve. We've got many issues that we're focusing on, but there is a clear um, and committed approach to, to simplify our ways. So the theme that we're gonna uh, take you through is about firstly about simplification and I think it's an area that is not talked about enough um, and as I've referred to there I think it's a strategic imperative it's things that we we really all need to focus on of keeping things as simple as possible um, if we can do that then we can then improve the engagement with employees um, making an emotional connection the phrase that, that often goes around is around making safety personal um, and making environment relevant and I believe if we can simplify we have a much better chance of doing that we are in the fourth digital age um, and safety amongst all areas is really undergoing a transformation we're seeing the introduction of dynamic PPE that can give us body body temperature and body information we're seeing the introduction of, of data and analytics um, and we're also seeing the idea of, of smart wearables so with that we need to think about how we can innovate and then we'll finish with some Q&A so that's what I'd like to to discuss with you now Firstly, a bit about LR. Um, I'm not intending to, to, to sit here and give you a big overview. Allison's given a, a pretty good summary. We are a very uh, rich and old organization. Um, and we have a history of firsts. So some of the firsts we've been involved in are things like the Plimpsoll line for vessels, things like the A1 rating. It's a phrase that's often used a lot these days. These are all things that Lloyd's Register has, has been involved in, in developing. We are a very old organization dating back to 1760. Um, and our purpose is about making the world safer. So the kind of things that we get involved in are around making vessels safer. So we have a big sector in marine. Uh, we do a lot of work in offshore, some mainly around safety critical processes. And one of our most um, notable brands is Lloyd's Register Quality Assurance, LRQA. Um, we have about 6,800, 6, 7,000 employees and we're spread globally. Um, and the final thing to mention is we are a non-profit. So we are a social business and all of the money that, that we earn actually goes back to, to make the world a safer place in terms of funding research. So that's a bit about LR. Let's give you a bit of context. So I'll start by just giving you some reflections. And I think the reflections are important just to, to explain why I believe simplification is important. So I think the first thing to mention, and I'm gonna give you some statistics in a moment, um, first thing I will say is that the statistics I'll give you are, are from the UK, but they are very similar across the EU. So over the last 20 years, um, we've developed across the EU, in fact, globally in all of the developed world, uh, a really deep expertise in safety. Um, and we've got to the point, particularly with large organizations, where we have a good understanding of risk. We have the processes and systems in place but we're still failing really to make a connection and we're still having some very serious incidents. At the same time, 
the scope of safety professionals is widening. Um, in the UK at the moment and across Western Europe, we talk a lot about health, psychological health and occupational health. And safety professionals are asked to get involved in much more widened areas. So, for example, just this morning, we were talking in my organization about business resilience and risk mapping, um, which are not areas that, that traditionally safety professionals have been involved in. We're also looking at professionalization. So when, when I started in safety going back 25, 26 years ago, um, and I decided to, to make a career of it, um, there were very few universities for me to choose from to go and do a postgraduate degree in safety. Um, now there's a proliferation of many of them and almost all individuals at some point have got some form of higher professional diploma or degree. But I guess the challenge with this is, is really, is it working? And I would like to present three statistics for you. So the first one, and as I say, these are UK statistics, but the same can be said across the globe. The first one is, is there are still 70,000 serious incidents that are occurring globally. Um, and they're in the UK rather, and they're occurring every year. So despite the fact we're getting better, more focused, um, we are still seeing these types of incidents happening. Um, secondly, about 1.3 million workers are reporting that their health is affected by, by work. So we're seeing lots of cases of stress and overwork. And as we look at uh, pressures such as demanning um, in many sectors, particularly in areas that I work in, in aviation, marine, um, and high risk sectors like oil and gas, demanning is a big area. And these numbers haven't changed. And finally, and most significantly, um, about 142 deaths. Now, 101 is too many, 142 is a significant number, but probably most significant amongst them is that amongst all of these statistics, the numbers are not diminishing. So whether we look at health, whether we look at fatal accidents or major incidents, the impact of our standardization, the impact of our work, we have to question what particular effect we're having and really is the approach that we have around a big focus around systems and process um, and control, because that's a lot of what we've been focusing on for the last 10, 15 years, is that working? Um, and I would argue that actually it's not. Um, and so for those reasons, LR has pushed along the lines of doing a simplification. But I'm just going to give you some other um, reflections first and foremost before we go into to what LR is doing. Um, the first thing is the world around us is changing. So we have the introduction of the gig economy. Over the last five years, we've seen the introduction of part-time and gig-related work. So for those not familiar with the term, that is where there isn't a traditional employment pattern. And it could be driving uh, taxes, it could be deliveries but we're seeing the introduction of much more different forms of employment. This is relevant for safety and environment because it questions the contract that we have between our employees and how far we can go in terms of providing the right equipment. I've mentioned already data and digital, and I would suggest that probably amongst the, the trends uh, that we're facing in safety, data and digital is probably one of the biggest opportunities that we have. We have to be very careful with it, of course, because we have GDPR with us now, and there's all the issues around who owns the data and what we're gonna do with it. But the more that we understand the data, the more opportunities we have to, 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 to do targeted intervention. For those of us with young children, you'll be well familiar with the, the children themselves. So this concept of Generation Z, that in essence is the children of the millennials. That's relevant because the employees that are coming through our workplaces now, they think differently, they want to be engaged differently, they demand different forms of, 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 of employment from us. So for example, our graduates at Lloyd's Register, they demand a different form of, of employment, different forms of consensual, they want more voice in our policies and procedures, and they are more confident in speaking out when they don't think something is right. Um, they tend to be more tribal, they've been brought up in a social network environment. Um, on the flip side, however, distraction is a huge issue for them. So Generation Z, we have to think differently, we have to tutor them differently, train them differently. On the flip side of that, we've got employees aging workforce. So at Lloyd's Register and in all organizations I've worked with in the last 10 years, we're seeing a higher number of employees going beyond their, their retirement age. Employees working into their late 60s and in some cases into their 70s. How does, what type of risk does that present for us? 
And finally, and most obviously, we have the, the trend of psychological health, uh, mental health, which is an issue that across Europe is really growing. Um, and we saw in the UK um, recently a big focus on that on World Mental Health Day and a lot of large organizations really starting to redirect their safety programs towards mental health and psychology. So with all of that said, um, with the changing context and changing statistics and the challenge of, of what we are impacting and is our measures having the desired effect on individuals, um, at Lloyd's Register we decided to, to change our approach. So I joined LR just over two and a half years ago and I was uh, hired with the deliberate intent of, of doing something different because we had tried all the traditional approaches of doing behavioral observation and um, doing all of the observations and all of that sort of work. We tried a very strong systems-based approach and I'll share with you um, how we've had to change that. And we decided to try something different because the universal feedback from our managers and from our employees was that uh, there was a disconnection. We were trying to mechanicalize safety through processes and procedures and it wasn't having the impact that we thought it would do. So that said, what, we, what the plan that we've developed is really fivefold. Um, the first that I'm going to really talk about is about simplification. So how do we simplify our processes? I'll give you some numbers in terms of how far we'd gone with simplification. Um, secondly, engagement. We talk a lot about engagement with employees and it's a bit of a buzzword going across safety. But what does it actually mean to engage with safety and how do we actually make that happen? We're doing a lot of work on, on piloting innovating technology. In fact, my whole safety team has been tasked with picking one pilot. So we have a team of just under 30 safety and environmental professionals in Lloyd's Register, and every one of them is doing pilots on different forms of technology and just trying something different. And if it doesn't work, then we'd be brave and, and try something else. This concept of data, I'm not going to talk a lot about it today, but what we're trying to do by simplifying is create an environment where we can look much more at the right data as opposed to purely looking at lagging indicators such as, as incident rates. Um, and something I would say finally, which is dear to my heart, which is creating an organizational memory. So when something tragically does happen, a major incident or a high potential incident, then how do we learn from it? Um, and that the worst thing of all from an incident is the impact it has on the individual and their families and their colleagues. Second to that is the fact when we don't learn from it. Um, so we're putting a lot of emphasis on learning from incidents and trying to focus and introduce a, a more hearts and minds approach to how we learn from incidents. So I'm going to talk to you mainly around those first two areas of simplification and hopefully we'll draw on some of the other elements around data and learning as we go through this. We have a plan. Uh, you can see the plan in the top right hand side. Um, our plan runs for four years and we are in the process now of looking at the next phase of our plan. We have five themes and you can see there those five themes on the left hand side. For each theme in our strategy you will see this little uh, screenshot there of how we will do it. So what are the actual measures we're going to do? Because our, our surveyors, our assessors, our managers, the big thing they said to us is, yeah, yeah talk is great, but actually what are you gonna do? Um, so we had to set it out very clearly um, and use language and forms of, uh, of communication that were understandable globally and try and avoid management speak, which is something that doesn't really translate very well. So let's have a, a bit of a dive into some of these areas and explore um, some of the areas a bit more. So the first thing is our management system. So we are an organization involved in safety critical assurance. We go onto vessels, we go onto oil rigs, um, we go into anything that is safety critical and we provide that degree of assurance. So we sign it off and say, is it safe? Um, we got to a point with our management system that it became burdensome. And if I give you the numbers, you can see written on the page there, we had a management system that when we, we counted everything, when I came in, it, it had reached 560 pages. Um, now, it's very, very difficult for anybody be, to be able to actually understand what we're asking them to do when we get to 560 pages. And the universal cry from our managers was, can you just tell me, you know, give me some guidance, tell me when I do this particular job in this particular country, the kind of things that you want us to do. 
um, and what the kind of decision making processes you would like us to follow. So we went through a process of simplification um, and many organizations are really beginning to look at it now and I'm happy to share with you how we went about it in a, in a moment. Um, we also looked at our competency. We were pretty much focusing a lot on PowerPoint. So doing lots of presentations in training rooms. Um, and so we decided to do things differently, to introduce video tutorial. And rather than use actors, we actually used our own employees. And so I'll share with you an example from one of them that we've introduced. We've got 10 of them. Um, we're developing the next set now. We also focused on, on the technology. So we went out and developed an app. And I know Alison's got an app that she's very proud of and it looks extremely good. And we also have an app at, at LR that we use for risk assessment and near miss reporting. And these concepts have actually make it simple. So what we did is we looked not only at the paperwork, but looks at the processes. And we were requiring people to fill in paperwork. And so the idea of introducing and developing an app um, to make it simpler, not only enabled our employees to, to actually give us information to do the risk assessments, but on the flip side, enabled us to gather data, um, which we'll talk about. Um, engagement's a key thing, and I'll give you some examples. So these kind of phrase of use from telling to selling, um, and I'll explain why I believe that's important, because storytelling really makes an emotional connection with employees. And we found that everyone is a natural storyteller, and that rather than me telling you about a safety incident that happened and use the, the traditional format of a safety alert, what we wanted to do was actually get people to tell their story. So when something happened, um, either an incident that happened, something they witnessed or something can involve them, to tell it in their own words. Um, and it's, we're not there yet, but we have some early examples of how we're trying to use storytelling. And the final thing is on root cause analysis. Um, so when something does go wrong, the most important thing for us is about learning. So these, this is a particular area. We've put um, roughly around 163, 160, 170 people through um, root cause analysis training. Um, and that helps us in a number of ways. It helps us understand what's really going wrong in terms of an incident, rather than just looking at the immediate causes but it also helps educate our managers and to understand why we're asking a lot more um, questions about an incident. So let's start just by talking about simplification. So here you will see an example of a classic Pareto. And here's an example from, from driving. So if, if I was to ask everybody on the call just to write down everything that they know about driving safely and everything that they could, the advice that they would give us about driving safety, they would normally run to about two to three pages of advice because everyone on the call is a safety expert and everyone will be able to share what they've learned from training for advice. The problem with that is we reach a law of diminishing returns and we reach something called Miller's Law. And Miller's Law is, is that, that actually we can only really remember seven things plus or minus two. The clever ones of us can remember up to nine things at any one point. Um, and unfortunately, uh, those that have a poor memory like myself can probably only remember about five things at any one point. Now, this is relevant because what we're trying to do with safety now is, is apply some elements of psychology and say, what, does, what do we learn about the brain rather than proceduralizing everything? What do we learn about our ability to actually take information on? And then we introduce this concept of chunking. So in essence, what we've done with simplification is we've looked at the law of diminishing returns, we looked at our incident data, and then we then said for everything we know about driving, um, there are probably five, six, seven things that are most important. And I've put down there 80%. The actual number for us is about 92 to 95%. So in other words, if we get those six, seven things right, then 95% of the time, um, we will be safe. We can't avoid all incidents because driving is an incident where we're exposed to other individuals on the road. But what we can control um, are those things that are directly listed on the screen there. And that means that some of the other elements that you'll see on the sidelines, we put less emphasis on. It means that we don't train people, but the basics of what we promote and we try and simplify our systems around are around these set of behaviors. So that's what we mean by simplification looking at the data, doing some studies, look, applying concepts like Pareto and also Miller's Law, and then using that to form the basis of our training. So we're not trying to capture everything, 
We're just trying to capture the things that are most important and that have the biggest impact. So that's that. And then, we've, then what we've then done is we then introduced a video tutorial. So I'm going to show you a video tutorial now. Um, this is one from pressure testing. We do a lot of pressure testing at, at Lloyd's Register. In fact, we do a lot of, of kind of high risk activities. And what's particularly important with pressure testing is that we get our, our key controls right and that everyone understands our, our critical safe behaviors. These critical safe behaviors that form the basis of our, of our key rules. So let's have a look at a video now and hopefully you'll be able to, to see and view the video. It is a, a, a shortened version of the, of the whole video. Pressure testing has significant risks due to the high energy stored within systems and the explosive nature of potential failures. The LR Lifesaver pressure testing is applicable to testing pipework, vessels and tanks and holds using gas or fluid at the testing medium. Testing with gas, pneumatic testing, is inherently more hazardous than testing with fluid hydrostatic testing and should not be used unless absolutely necessary. Before starting work, take two minutes to assess the risks by using a safe start checklist or ideally the safe start app. Only conduct pressure tests when a safe system of work has been implemented. Give yourself a head to toe check to make sure you have the right PPE. Only work near pressure systems if you fully understand the hazards and a safe system of work is in place. In summary, when working on pressure systems, always demonstrate the critical safe behaviors, which are to identify the hazards and assess the risks. To make sure you have the right PPE, plan your work and ensure a safe system is in place. Check safety equipment, always obey safety barriers and ensure you keep a safe distance at all times. So you can see there a very shortened version of, of one of our Lifesaver videos. Um, they are our employees um, in the videos. And when we went about developing these Lifesavers, we didn't do it from upon high um, and actually say, these are, these are what we think. Um, we went out and we did three rounds of consultation globally. We went out and did workshops with our employees. And most importantly, we looked at our data and what is our data actually telling us? Then what we then did is we then involved our employees in the process. Um, we went to them and we shot uh, 10 videos in the first bout of the training, um, involved all of our employees and actually our clients in that session, you know, commissioning a professional media company to produce them. Um, we then embedded the videos into various PowerPoint and workshop material. Um, and the way that we, we deployed the material was particularly different from the way that we'd done it before. The first thing is, is that we translated it into our 12 operating languages across the group. Um, so that took a fair bit of time. But probably most importantly is rather than just tell people these are our new, new safety requirements, this is our new safety system. We actually went out and did it as a, as a risk assessment consultation exercise. So if you imagine we've, we have the material, we show the material, and then we then ask people, where are the areas that you can't comply? So you can see in the bottom right hand side there, some examples from some of the workshops. Well, what we're doing is in, in groups of typically about 10 to 15. So uh, we did about 200 of these sessions globally. Um, we went out and trained people and then said, right, these are our requirements. Where can you not comply? And then we then through a series of breakout sessions, we learned more about the challenges and the problems that our employees would face um, than we did through any risk assessment exercise or for any risk of risk of workshop um, by actually showing them this is what we want you to do where can you not comply and this is particularly important because we found through the engagement and through consultation that employees really warmed to that and then what we then did is every workshop then had a series of, of outcomes and typically about 10 or 20 that we then listed and we gradually worked through some of which we could address ourselves some of which involve going to, to clients. Um, and we then, over a period of time, and it typically, typically took about two months, we then went through each particular issue and fed back to the employees what the problems were. 
So we now believe we've got to a state where, where they're generally understood. What we're now doing um, is actually undertaking practical training. So we're going back to the, to the old methods of teaching. We've done classroom training, and we now have a project that's just under two, 2.5 million euros to train our employees practically in some of these skills um, that were not being practically trained previously. So that's the engagement piece about how we deployed it. We involved our employees and we really made it relatable to them. Um, and then we, we discussed issues and, uh, and problems that they had. So the next stage is about making it personal. Now, so far, all I've done is, is we've introduced a different form of training. We've simplified our requirements, but in terms of actually engagement with employees and making it personal, we haven't done a great deal of that. So the phase that we, we next moved on to was about making it personal. So I don't know about you, but, but whenever anybody shows me a graph or a spreadsheet, I, I don't find it particularly appealing. But what I do find appealing is when someone shows a story. Um, and we know this because social media teaches us that, that the biggest hits, the biggest things that actually influence people are when someone actually shares something on social media. And we find that with our, with our Yammer social media at Lloyd's Register. So we wanted to introduce a, a concept of storytelling. Now, this is how we're trying to make safety personal. And it's fundamentally what we're trying to do is, is to recognize that the, the, the most influential people for our surveyors, our assessors, and our, our support personnel is actually not, not our leadership team. It's actually um, the individuals sitting alongside them. Because if you or your colleagues share a story about a driving incident, or perhaps a slip or trip, or something that happened in a hazardous environment, that's much more memorable. And it touches your heart much more than sitting there and me reading off a safety alert and saying this happened to someone in a, in a particular country because it doesn't resonate. So this concept of actually making it personal is an example here of where we tried to actually change our approach to where we learn from incidents. So I'm going to share some examples from some of our personnel. And so what we now ask people to do is to when, we, when there is an incident, when there is something that they want to share, to get their phone out and to record it. But to enable them to do that, we had to introduce and um, provide some training. So in the top right hand side, left right hand side, sorry, you will see my safety story. So it's a little tutorial where we teach people how to record a video, how to tell their story. Um, surveyors, engineers, they love to talk technical, but often the technical doesn't really work in a story. So what we want them to do is just to say in simple terms what happened. So I'm going to show you uh, two or three stories. I'll start by sharing um, some stories from two of our surveyors. And then we also went round as part of our, our Making It Personal campaign with a video booth round to our offices and our survey offices and asked people to talk about our new lifesavers and why they were important to them. So let's have a look at um, some videos now from our, our surveyors. So when we were in front of the secret, the mystery drawer, I found the secret break isolated like this. If you can see, secret break is open. It's locked with the padlock, but the padlock itself is not closed. This is wrong. It's a wrong way to isolate uh, electrical equipment because somebody can just remove the padlock and the circuit breaker is ready to operate. So before carrying any electrical inspection, we need to verify that the equipment which is going to be surveyed need to be electrically isolated, the circuit bracket correct lock, and the key for the padlock is to be enhanced of the electrician or the person who has signed the permit to work. A few days ago, I went on board the ship and the pilot ladder was not completely secured. Immediately, I stopped and called the chief officer and asked him to secure it. A couple of minutes later, the crew did it, and I could go on board safely. I have fallen to the sea twice. I know the risks, and I know what you feel when you fall into the cold water. Please, always use your life jacket, and never climb with your backpack. Very simple safety precautions. Use gloves, a torch for your helmet for night disembarking, 
count the steps of the pilot ladder until the deck or the embarkation ladder. Check the rolling and pitching of the ship and the swell high altitude. Be aware and do not be afraid of saying no. A large life safer are important to me to keep me safe and enjoy the next adventure of my life. And our lifesavers are important to me because actually we actually have one chance and we have to get it right. So it's about uh, caring uh, about our own safety and the safety of others, of all our colleagues. LR lifesavers are important to me because I want to see my children grow up and see what their future holds. So there you can see some examples of our video stories and, and put in, in summary, this is a concept of what we term horizontal learning. So the idea is rather than me teach or my team or our managers actually teach people and tell them what our requirements, we're introducing the concept of get colleagues to teach each other because everyone is a safety expert. Everyone has experiences to tell. So we as the safety team, we need to be humble and recognize that actually it's the surveyors and the assessors that really know the risk best. Um, and if we can get them to tell their story, it is so much more impactful than paperwork or safety alerts or anything else that we can do. Now with that, I will say that we have also had to take some, some brave decisions. So I, I started by talking about how our safety system, we've had to reduce it from 560 down to 50 pages. That was a, a brave decision in itself um, and had to involve a lot of consultation. The other thing that we've done is we've moved away from mandating near miss safety observation targets. We used to have a culture where everybody was required to, 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 to actually um, complete near miss safety observations. And it's, 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 desire, it's set out with the right intentions initially, but it, it was driving the wrong behavior where we were getting the wrong type of, of information from our employees. And they were doing it because we told them to do it, not because they actually had anything meaningful or useful or most importantly, wanted to say something. So by making safety personal and actually introducing video tutorials and getting people to focus on the quality of the safety observations versus actually targets, um, this has been brave, but also is starting to, to really show some impact in terms of people's engagement with the program. So let's move on. Um, so, so far we've simplified the system. We've tried to make it personal. Um, we've done a lot of training and we've got a lot more training to do. Um, what we're also trying to do is look at the processes. So we talked a moment ago around our app. So we have a, a risk assessment app and we was introduced because um, we were sending our surveyors out with paperwork. Um, I'm sure you all know the problems of doing task risk assessment. Um, and there's a phrase that I've put there in, in, the, uh, in the slide about the best person to assess the risk is the individual facing it. And I think that's really true. But to, to get them to actually do the risk assessment and to do it well, we need them to actually give them give the tools to do it and to do it simply. So we went out and commissioned a, a risk assessment app and there are many out there on the market and, and Alison's got a great one as well that I've seen. Um, and these apps are, are particularly helpful in terms of giving the safety individual in the pocket of every one of our surveyors. So in our particular app, um, we, we are able to push information to employees. So you've seen a couple of the, the, the stories, uh, video stories, and you've seen that our surveyors go out into sea conditions. So we're able, the moment they open the app up, to give them the weather and the sea state information. So it tells them what the, what the weather is. One of our other risks is around temperature. Um, we do a lot of work in high temperature tropical environments, so we can give that information. We can send emergency information to employees uh, via the app. But, but on the flip side, what we can actually do is start to get data. So we have around 26,000 of these risk assessments completed so far, each of them having around 18 to 20 data points. So the big phrase going through data and digital at the moment is around big data. So we're starting to get much more richer data in terms of what our employees are saying uh, and what they're doing. So that is a case of us looking at the system. So I'm going to try and conclude now because I'm sure some of you may have some questions around what we do just by giving you a summary of, of what we've done. So, so far we've trained up uh, 7,200 colleagues, including our retained contractors. That's that's what we've done over the last uh, eight months. Um, we get about seven to 800 safety engagements. So these are near-miss reports every month. 
So every month we're having these reports come through from our employees. At about 200 times, we're having our employees actually stop work. Now it could be that they actually, it's so serious they can't proceed, but in most cases they're asking the client to make a very small change. But we measure this. Um, a lot of people talk about stop work authority. What we try and do at LR is actually measure it to say, is it one of the indicators that we can actually say, are we getting things right? Because it gives us an indication on the culture, whether our employees feel empowered, but it also gives us an indication in terms of, did we get the job right? Did we set it up right? Um, the, our incidence rates um, uh, have reduced. Now we've got, now got the six year where we've reduced our lost time and our total recordable rate. But probably most importantly is the fact that we've replaced our lost time incident rate with more leading indicators. So our first indicator now on the incidents is our high potential rate. So we measure the number of incidents that could have resulted in harm, in serious harm, um, whether they actually did or had the potential to do so. So high pose, high potential incidents for us are, are, are key. Um, we've done an EOS survey, an employee opinion survey, where we've gone out and asked our employees and 82% an are favorable to the change. Um, and then I think just in summary, um, in conclusion, my, my kind of message to everybody would be to really look at simplifying it and to, to, to use the phrase much, much uh, quoted by Gandhi, to walk in the, the shoes of the surveyor, the assessor or your employees, to think about what it's like for them and to ask some questions. For example, one of the questions we like to ask is, is you know, what's the most difficult thing we ask you to do? What's the most stupid thing we ask you to do? Uh, and you'd be amazed what what information employees are actually giving us. Um, engaging employees and really involving them through the process, that has been paramount in terms of trying to change our approach from just telling people what we want them to do to recognizing that they're the experts and, and engaging with them. Thirdly, focusing on our key risks. Uh, these, the slide I began with, which was about our Pareto, um, we are less concerned about um, incidents of a minor nature. Um, and that's been brave as well. So, you know, in some instances, we've had incidents that have resulted in, in recordable incidents or even lost time incidents that we've turned around and said, uh, we're sorry that happened and we'll do the right thing to care for the employee, but, but there's not a lot we can learn from this, um, as opposed to an incident that involves driving, um, perhaps involves some, some high risk activities for us, like confined space entry, um, and really focusing on, on those particular risks. Storytelling, hopefully you can see some examples of how we're trying to make safety really personal to individuals. Um, and then we're trialing new technologies. And I could talk to you for, for, for the next two hours about the technology and the trialing that we're doing. Um, but I think that's probably enough talk from me. Um, and then I'll leave it over to, to yourselves in terms of questions that you may have um, at this point here. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for that, James. That's fantastic. Um, so we are going to go on to the, the Q&A part now. <clears throat> um, and uh, just so that uh, so you understand how it's all going to work. Um, You'll notice that uh, on your on your screen somewhere that you should ha now have a raise hand option. Um, if you do have a question and you would like to ask that verbally, um, then you can do so by clicking on the raise the hand option. And what I will do is, as and when it's your turn, I will give you um, audio rights and then uh, I'll ask you to go ahead and ask your question. So uh, you will need to make sure that uh, if you have a, a computer microphone or a headset, that they are switched on and working. Um, Failing that, uh, we also have the option to, to write questions in. Um, so you can post those through the Q&A chat uh, and I can ask those questions uh, on your behalf. So, so we can do that. Um, for the purpose of the recording, um, that's going to be posted online. There will be no videos or webcams uh, displayed, uh, but people will, of course, be heard. So just bear that in mind. So if you don't want to be involved in that part in any way, then uh, you'll be safer just to, to ask a written question. Um, so with all that said, I'm going to start off with one of the questions that has come in in writing, uh, and then we'll go over to some verbal ones. So uh, just to begin with then, James, um, what methods did you use to simplify your systems? Um, I think the first thing we did, Ben, is, is we looked at uh, what our risks were. So we went back to our risk assessment, um, then we went back to our data, um, and then most importantly, beyond the statistics, actually asked employees. 
um, what the issues were, but it had to be data driven in terms of a try, not trying to do everything, um, but trying to do the things that were most important. So statistics, our risk assessments, our accident data, and then all of the conversations. And we did four bouts of consultation globally, where we went out and we did workshops with employees and we did virtual uh, activities like this, webinars, where we talked about what we thought our key risks were. Um, and that was it, really. Okay, great. Um, we've got a, a question that's been, uh, been going to be asked by Mohammed. So, uh, Mohammed, I have uh, I've just um, I've opened up and allowed you to, to chat. So, uh, if you would like to go ahead uh, and ask your question. Yeah. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jeff, just a question from my side. How how would you just mention okay, the setbacks of simplifying the process? What would be the, the setback from your perspective, or let me say the negative aspect of this? Oh, that's a really good question, Mohammed. Right. Um, the, the, the difficulty that we have with simplification, um, and, and your question really goes to the heart of some of the challenge that we have. Um, everyone wants to be empowered. Everyone says that they want um, more authority. What they don't necessarily think through, Mohammed, is actually the consequences of it. So if I simplify, um, and say, I'm not going to tell you, Mohammed, everything. I'm going to reduce from 560 pages down to 50. Suddenly, people have to make more decisions themselves. Suddenly, Group from London is not prescribing everything, and more risks have to be evaluated. If they're evaluated, then they have to be much more accountability locally. Um, so some people have warmed to it. Um, and I showed you some slides on our EOS survey, our employee opinion survey, those seven to 10% of people who really didn't welcome it were the ones who actually liked to be told what to do. Um, and that's part of our problem. The only addition I would add to that is in some countries, um, particularly North Asia, it's a challenge where the culture is more hierarchical. So understanding the cultural nuances um, alongside the individual preferences for people who like to be told versus like people who like to be empowered has been key as well. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, okay, thank you very much for asking that, Mohammed. Um, so the next person who has got their hand up is uh, Nicholas. So Nicholas, I'm just going to um, allow you to go ahead. So Nicholas, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yep, can hear you loud. Hi, hi, James. Thank you very much for the for the webinar. Super interesting. Um, I have a question. You 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 talked uh, about you know focusing on the key risks and having this eighty twenty Pareto approach, which I find very interesting, because <clears throat> I mean we've all seen that sometimes we we really spend lots of time and effort and money on trying to solve the unsolvable, and I I was just wondering you know in going into this approach, you must have had some serious tough discussions about accepting the fact that the, yes, there are some things we can't control and we should not focus on them, we should focus on the difference we can make. So I, I was wondering, you know, how, how did these discussions go and how, what were your, your arguments somehow to convince your team or the people around you that, you know, we need to focus on what makes a difference and we cannot solve every single problem? Yeah, I think, Nicholas, you, you, th that was difficult, I must admit. Coming in and, and saying to an organization that's prided itself on safety and where safety is at the heart of what we do, and also within the context of us working in safety critical industries and saying, actually, we, we don't want to focus on these areas um, because they're not relevant. Now, now th there is a very, how can I put it, um, a very tribal approach in safety. So, for example, um, we look at a trend and then we all go down that road and say we must do it. So an example would be uh, reverse parking. So reverse parking in many organizations is a big issue because the way people exit, particularly when you have large people leaving a build, uh, an organization at a set time, means that there's a risk of cars interacting with people. So we had a rule around reverse parking, but, but Philip, uh, uh, Nicholas, sorry, we only actually had three car parks um, and they're very small. So the question is, what do we gain by such uh, focus on this particular area? Um, we had a focus in many, uh, in many of our offices around some really kind of small issues, such as um, we had a, a major incident in one office, um, and then we were having a focus on, on burns, um, which was, wasn't really burns. It was actually just about people um, being slightly exposed to, to hot water. 
So really, does that actually drive us anywhere? So we have to look at what the data is actually telling us. And it's not an easy discussion to have, particularly with people who've been who've been saying every incident is is preventable. Um, what is particularly interesting, Nicholas, is, is this concept to focus on the things that really matter is at the heart of, of one element of, of safety at the moment, this concept of that Sydney Decker promotes around safety differently. So that's very much at the heart of, of this concept of, of focus on the things that are really important um, and get those things right. It's not that these uh, smaller pieces aren't right, it's just they shouldn't form the basis of a group program, a group initiative, and they certainly shouldn't feature in a set of group rules um, and group requirements. They should be local decisions and a focus on behaviours versus prescription. Uh, James, sorry, uh, thank you very much. Just so, does it mean that there is some, some form or some, some level of risk tolerance in, relate, in relation to safety in, in Lloyd, at Lloyd's Register today? We haven't gone down and actually done a risk tolerance exercise. Um, I kind of leave many of those exercises for, for, for governance and risk practitioners. Um, and it's a very difficult and emotive subject, Nicholas, to, to say that we have a tolerance of these areas. It's more a question of where we target our resources and what we communicate out, rather than saying we don't care about these areas. We care about every incident and everybody. It's just we only have a certain um area of focus in our communication we only have a certain element that we can we can promote out and most importantly when we look at psychology people only remember certain messages so what are those messages that we want them to focus upon all right thank you very much thank you james okay brilliant thank you um we're going to just ask i'm going to ask one that has been that's come in in writing and um, we'll go back to a couple more that uh, that have uh, got their hands raised so uh, this one then james is um uh, with the high level of regulation in most developed countries, such as the UK, uh, making safety simple is sometimes quite difficult. Um, but from a practical aspect, uh, getting employee engagement uh, practicality is in most cases mandatory. Uh, so how does LR bridge this gap between what it takes to drive towards a more cultural aspect and engage the employees from a practical aspect? Yeah, I think it, it, it's um, hopefully it comes through in some of the presentations in terms of how we've developed the materials. Um, I should say first and foremost that yes, there is a big focus in regulation on on uh, on safety, but actually, if you look at European legislation, U.S. legislation. Um, almost all of them are really focusing on the major risks. The things that, that, that the formal action is taken for people is generally when they're not controlling key risks. Um, and what we did when we developed uh, the materials is we actually had consultations with two of our regulatory agencies and said, these are the things that we, we want to focus on. Of course, they would not put it in writing, um, but we did engage with them and they said, yes, those are the kind of things that you really should focus on. We're also privileged in Lloyd's Register that we have a board director who is appointed to oversee safety. So we have a, one of our non-executive directors who is appointed and he's an, he's an individual out of, um, of high risk sectors. So he's out of um, one of the all majors. Um, and he looked to them and says, yes, those are the things we absolutely need to focus on. So we engage with our regulators um, as best we can and as best they will give us a decision. But most importantly, we engage with our employees and we've done that right the way throughout this process of, of listening to them. But I think at the heart of your question is a really important point, which is how do we trade between the trade off between what our regulators actually want us to have, which is often a 14 page procedure that, that you know, covers their particular elements and what we know actually works, which is something which is much more simple. And I think through debate and discussion, uh, we found at Lloyd's that it's been it's been successful in terms of persuading them that actually codifying everything, putting everything into a document has limited effect. We need to focus on the things that really matter um, and then trust people's judgment because at, at Lloyd's, 94% um, of our employees are graduates. So if 94% are, are skilled and have some experience in safety, then we should be able to to trust their judgment on some areas and not need to proceduralize some of those things. Excellent. Okay, uh, we'll go back to another verbal one. So um, we've got uh, someone who's raised a hand, uh, Richard Spitzer. Um, so I've just uh, just allowing you to to take the floor. So Richard, would you like to to go ahead and ask your question? 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, hello, James, and thank you very much for this presentation, which was really interesting. Um, I'm actually taking care of uh, the service business at Eaton, so meaning we have a lot of people going on their own at customers uh, for servicing our products. So it's it's really a, a challenging context in terms of having, um, I would say, a single person deciding whether or not he will work safely or unsafely. Uh, under the customer pressure from, from time to time. So in, in your approach, maybe not that much on the simplification, but more on the engagement part, um, because I believe you probably have the same type of jobs as well. Um, so how did you approach this, uh, I would say, aspect of, of dealing with people on their own and trying to create, I don't remember exactly the word you were saying, but this kind of... Uh, collective conscience of, of people um, so that they would all, I would say, react the same in, in front of a, of a specific situation and obviously the right way. <laughs> yes, I, I, I don't claim to have the, the answer, but I'll share with you what, what, we, what we've done and, and what is having an impact so far. But, but Richard, I would say that um, we are, like you, on a journey on this. Um, what we've done is really three things. Um, the first is we've looked at our processes so like yourselves, we have task assessment and task deployment. So when we, when we plan a job and we send an assessor to a site, um, what we found is rather than actually having things like our task risk assessment separate, we found it was is, uh, lately it's been far more effective to integrate it into the task setup. So when the assessor turns up for the day, he or she would then start actually uh, completing their, their documentation, their sign on to actually complete their survey, their assessment. We found it was much more helpful to actually integrate our risk assessment setup into into the job planning so they can't actually start the job until it's technology till the assessment is completed the second area is we're doing a lot of work at the moment around fatigue um, so like you we have a mobile workforce and probably one of our biggest issues is around fatigue and, and job planning so we've developed algorithms that we've put into our job planning process so we can start to look at how many hours the individual is driving collectively how many hours they're working over a period and then how many driving hours they've got within a week. So in this focus on, on behaviors and simplification, uh, probably what hasn't come across is the fact we're also looking a lot at the processes to set the job up right um, so that, that we, the employees can make the right decisions. And I think finally, Richard, what we've done is um, when we've had incidents and accidents and, and uh, openly put my hand up and say we have and still continue to have incidents that we learn from we still haven't got this right yet um, we make sure that we learn from it um, and w w the the just and fair model that we use means that when something does happen um, we we share that um, but we're putting a lot of focus on getting employees to share their stories um, so we have about 800 near miss observations per month, near miss and safety observations, things our surveyors see or that happen to them. And every one of those uh, goes to the manager and we ask the managers, read them, review them and say, thank you. Thank you for, for reporting that incident. And then we can then learn from it. So those are the kind of things that we're focusing on. Uh, they're helping us, but um, I will just conclude Richard by saying, we have not got this right yet. This is the, the, the elements that we're focusing on at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we've got another one, uh, another Richard, actually, uh, Richard Greer uh, this time. So um, I have just uh, given you access. Uh, so Richard, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Good morning, James. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the uh, the show. It was very, very interesting. It's very inspiring from my point of view. Uh, and I'm going to be taking the whole use of video to a new level, I think. Um, but I do have a question about um, how the impact and the and this city the issues that you faced with your own team and indeed maybe the legal group within the lr as you went through the process of simplification of your system did you have any issues with your local team and if so how did you overcome that with your local safety professionals yeah yeah um yes i think it's it's like a question we had earlier um not so much issues with the legal to be honest richard it was um yeah, let me let me try and explain it in, in two ways, if I may. Um, the first is is culturally. Um, I, I have a team of just under 30 safety professionals. 
some are, are really keen for a more uh, a, what I would term a freedom within a framework. So we have a framework now of of, of simplified process of 50, 50 odd pages, twenty four standards. These are the things that I think a group should focus on. Um, and then we have local procedures. So there is some cases where local procedures are appropriate. So. Um, the, the, the first thing I would say is, is getting our safety team to be confident to, to operate in, in a more autonomous and local decision-making context. So in, in 560 pages, particularly our Asian teams um, and our teams in South America, we told them what to do and we gave them Richard a big stick and said, there you are, that, those are your requirements, now go and make it happen. Um, but when you simplify down, I remove that big stick and say, these are a set of principles. These are the core elements I want you to focus on. What I need you to do is to then go and engage with the business, to hear people's stories and, and address and develop local policies for that. So when I say we've reduced from 560 down to 50, we have not only removed the level of rules that we had before, but we've also moved to a more principles-based approach that I think a group um, a global operation should do and there are some businesses not all who have then developed some local policies so local policies for example around driving I'll give you an example in India we do not allow anybody other than Indian Indian nationals to drive because it's um, and the same in in Pakistan and many of other our, our countries so that's a local policy and then we have local advanced driving in other countries where they have to do local driving and journey management plans. So that level of fine detail still does exist. So uh, two ways to answer your question. The first is um, we have not done away entirely with local procedures. We still give the authority to do so within our freedom, within a framework model. But the, probably the biggest issue is getting our safety team to be comfortable operating in more of a selling environment rather than just walking around with a set of 560 pages and saying this is the way it must be done yeah, yeah no, very good no, thank you but, but i should say finally richard we have had to do a lot of training we've put the whole safety team through um psychometric testing giving them feedback and training them on how to to, to actually engage in a different way and that is is another work in progress that we have yeah very interesting no, thank you james Excellent. Okay. Um, I'm aware that we are, we have come to the end of our time. Uh, I'm just going to just ask one final question just because it has come in. It is our final question. Uh, just very quickly, James, did, um, did you get any feedback from the HSC uh, of any of your simplified written processes? Uh, none. Well, we got some verbal feedback from the HSE where they said, yes, we were focusing on the right things. Um, and they also commented that our approach on simplification fits in with their making safety uh, sensible and pragmatic. They have a big campaign they've been running for about two to three years where they're trying to bring a sense of normality to safety. Um, and the comments we got were that this fits in line with that. We also engage with the regulators in Korea. Um, and in Singapore and they said a similar thing that what they're really concerned about is fatal and major injury um, and these are the areas from a safety perspective that we should be focusing on. Excellent okay thank you well that is actually all of our questions uh, answered which is fantastic. Uh, look James thank you very much uh, for delivering that uh, that session it was really informative and I think a lot of people got a lot of things out of it which is great. Alison, did you want to say a final few few uh, words to people before we before we end this webinar? Well, mostly a huge thank you to James. Um, I think that as a subject is something that a lot of companies are going to be able to gain from. Um, we've seen accidents and incidents come down and then hit this plateau and how you move through that plateau, your real examples of what you're doing and 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 you have to be brave to, to make some of those decisions. And, you know, we look at them and, and, and think, oh, you know, sit on the fence a bit sometimes. So actually seeing it work and now maybe giving us some, some ammunition that we can bolster ourselves and, and take forward um, is, is really, really valuable. Thank you very much, James. Really good. No, no thank um, you. And thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to share.
Brilliant. Okay. Uh, as I say, the the session has been recorded as well, so uh, we will be able to people will be able to watch this back at a later stage or distribute it if they if they wish uh, for other people to see uh, people who have unfortunately been able, un, un, been unable to actually attend today. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you, Alison, for for organising it. Um, and I hope that all of you who were involved uh, found it useful. Thank you very much for attending, and and hopefully we'll see you at the next one.